Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be finally made my way to Liverpool. I've never been here, which is almost an insult for a physical oceanographer, spending quite some time in UK, various uh, outfits where marine science happened, but never been up here. So thank you for inviting me to be part of this conference. I'm also very impressed about the number of attendees, and I heard yesterday that you had a great set of excellent talks. We don't have that in Germany. We don't run national ocean conference. Maybe we should. I think it's a great idea because I'm seeing so many, you know, sort of a great mixture of more senior scientists, but all these young people and great ideas, I'm sure. So that's wonderful. I really appreciate that. I want to single out one person in this room who is also a local, that is Harry Leach. He sits way back there. Everything I have learned about seagoing physical oceanography, I've learned from Harry. He was certainly the chief scientist on the first couple of cruises I've been at in the North Atlantic. So I really want to say that in public that I really owe a lot of my career to him. And then there are many others who are also in the room who I've had the opportunity to work with over the years. I do work at GEOMA, as you just heard, at the Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research. And I'm also a professor at Kia University. So I teach uh, physical oceanography in my day job and do marine science and do get to go to sea still. But I also work a lot in what we call integrated marine science, uh, trying to bring the various disciplines and knowledges uh, from around the ocean together to think about the future of the ocean, to think about opportunities and challenges for sustainable development. An area I'd love to talk about more than an hour, but I can't. So uh, this talk will be really about my home base uh, work, which is physical oceanography. And I've prepared a, a tale of two regions for you for the next half hour or so. And I'll say something about the North Atlantic thermohaline uh, overturning circulation. And I'll introduce to you to some of our work that we do in the tropical ocean, uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean, about oxygen minimum zones. We also do some work in the Pacific uh, on that topic. But uh, why don't we start with the North? I mean, this is a topic that for this audience, I don't think I really have to introduce in a significant way. But I do sometimes uh, like to start simple and show some overview slides. And all of them, obviously, are stolen from somebody else. So this is a Woods Hole uh, view of the world, where you basically see the warm waters of the Gulf Stream heading north, cooling at some high latitudes and returning as cold waters. And that's part of the thermal driven circulation. The heat transport associated with that overturning circulation is a component in the, um, in the heat planetary heat budget of our planet. It probably is a strong component to keep your weather here in England uh, rather mild. It's debatable how much we feel from that in Germany. It's probably mostly atmospheric heat transport that gets to Germany, but it's still quite interesting. It also does not only move heat around, it also moves carbon around, nutrients and other substances. And I think there's a number of reasons to be interested in that. I will be speaking mostly of this corner up here in the north, um, but I will make some reference of the works that you are, many of you are involved in here with the RAPID program. Let me get started by showing an iconic uh, image from Igor Yasheev from uh, Canada. Uh, and it is actually in the Labrador Sea proper here. Uh, Igor lives over here in Halifax, but uh, they do a lot of work uh, traditionally in the Labrador Sea. And I'm showing you pretty much what is known about water mass properties in the Labrador Sea since about 1940, 1935. That is one of the longest records of water mass property we have anywhere on the planet. And that's why it's so iconic, not just to the ones who are myself who are interested in deep ocean convection. And when you look at over the years, you see salinity as a function of depth and time on the top and temperature at the bottom. You see that, for example, it was sort of coolish in the 50s. In the 60s, it was rather warm, a bit of cold again. And then here in the 90s was a very cold phase. And in the 90s is about the time when I wrote, or the late 80s, when I wrote my PhD on deep convection in the Labrador Sea. And I was very fortunate to be involved in an experiment that actually took place when deep convection happened in the Labrador Sea. If that experiment had taken place a decade later, where hardly any convection has happened, that would have been a difficult thing to do. So we were lucky, I guess, that climate decay or climate variability was in our favor and happened to align with our scientific programming. That's no guarantee in these uh, cases. And you see, uh, so it's quite variable, and uh, you can, you can, what, what jumps at you is the variability, maybe more so than the change, although there is also some subtle warming over the years, and you also see uh, a bit of a freshening here, and, and as of late, uh, more salty water invading. 
Now, this is uh, based on hydrographic sections, usually done once a year. There's also some, there used to be a weather station there, a weather ship stationed there that took measurements. But in today's world, we get robots to do uh, a job for us. And please don't tell anybody that I showed this picture to you. Igor Yashev mailed it around to me uh, last week, and I'm not sure I got his permission to show it to you. Uh, <laughs> but I do, because what's exciting about it, so you look at, uh, Again, he has temperature on the top and salinity at the bottom. Over the last few years, this is since 2003 till a few months, few weeks ago actually, that uh, this cold water evaded here 2003 and 4 a bit, not as strong as in the 90s, but still. And then there was not much convection going on at all. And the last two years have been exciting again up there. Lots of convection in the Labrador Sea. So you see variability kind of dominates the picture. And today we can almost see it up to the last week, what is going on there thanks to robots like Argo. What I will talk a bit more about is the other way to do sustained observing, uh, not by freely drifting robots, but by fixed observatories. So here I'll show you some results from moored observatories, and you see some pretty pictures about how they work. Many of you here know how that's done, so I won't go into the technology. And I'll just show you uh, what we are, as a community, capable of doing today uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. So wherever you see a colorful dot, more or less, there is a moored system in the ocean, or has been. It's not always exactly up to date, but close to. And those observatories that focus on the overturning circulation are, have a little bit of a call out here. There's a couple of them I say a word about, about the overflows here, Denmark Strait and Iceland, Scotland. Uh, then I'll speak mostly about the work that we do here at 53 North in the Labrador Sea. Uh, there are some other arrays that have been put out, obviously the rapid array that you guys know all about. And there's a cousin a bit to the south called MOVE, and there's just now being starts of doing something also in the South Atlantic. So I can't cover all of that, so I'll be a little bit selective. And I'm going to start uh, with this guy here. Uh, any of these sites always have heroes. They don't show up because somebody thinks they ought to be done. It's scientists who really devote their career to do the job. And the first hero is Bogie Hansen from the Faroe Islands. And he has been the one who's been manning uh, this place here that, that overflowed the deepest still in the, in the Shetland Channel, Faroe Shetland Channel. It's a pretty narrow place. It's only 10 kilometer wide. Uh, which is wonderful for long-term observing because pretty much with one mooring, or literally with one ADCP, you can do the job. That is one of the very few places where you can do it with that little effort, and they've been doing it since quite a while. And um, now, I, I, sometimes I prepare the slides a little differently when I lecture more to students, but I'll do it uh, with you just uh, as an example. When Bogie had the first five years, from 1995 to about 1999, so these are the first five years, and if you do it, a careful trend of around the first five years, you notice a decline of about 20%. And after five years, he wrote a paper to, I believe, Nature or Science, I think it was Nature, uh, and he talked about the decline of the outflow. And people thought, hey, you know, the thermohaline circulation is already stalling, and we can see it. So that trend after five years published in Science gave him a lot of resources to keep going. The more careful analysis over a 10-year record, which basically says no change, never made it to science. <laughs> so that record is best known for its trend that isn't there, okay? <laughs> uh, but it also shows you something about uh, that business. So sometimes luck is in your favor. Having a trend the first five years is really good for funding. Uh, but actually assessment, uh, you need a longer record and uh, they still keep going at it and I really applaud them for that. The next hero is Detlef Quadfasel and now Kerstin Jochemsen from Hamburg and they've been manning uh, this place called the Denmark Strait. It's on the other side. You also see here a fairly long record. Uh, different colors mean different configuration of the ADCPs. They usually use three of them. And you also see some gaps in the record. Well, that is not because the heroes were unable to do the work. They tried very hard. But here's a case where the scientific research had an encounter with its stakeholders in an unfortunate way the stakeholders being the fisheries community, commercial fishermen. And Denmark Strait is heavily fished by bottom trawling. And if an ADCP is in your way, too bad for the scientist. And these ADCPs, although they're in trawl protected uh, structures, have been pulled out one, two, three times by our stakeholders. So sometimes a stakeholder interaction can be also the detriment to a scientific record, but it's very hard to do. But also here you see some variability, but long-term, pretty stable still. I think that ought to be good news. 
It's very consistent with our understanding of climate change, but if you're looking for funding, that's bad news. It's kind of boring, right? And you're going to hear me say that a few times, and, and I think that's where we, the challenge that we have is observing. Well, now we get closer to the Labrador C53 North, and the hero here is really Fred Schott and Jürgen Fischer from my lab. And uh, Jürgen has worked with Harry for years. I don't know how many. We won't disclose that Harry will be. Uh, but Jürgen has been really been very instrumental in getting the record uh, going up there. Uh, so it looks at the Labrador Sea outflow at 53 North. And here you see an estimate of transport uh, from that part of the world, somewhere between 10 and 20 sweaters. And you see here these dark lines are heavily low-pass filtered versions. And these lines show you more or less a five-day average of the circulation. And you see some variability. It's a 17-year long record. It actually is the longest record of a Western boundary transport anywhere on the planet. And it's also quite interesting for us to look at that. So again, Jürgen uh, managed to get uh, that side going. And here is a green bit here. There we only have one or two moorings, and we're not 100% sure that our transport estimates are very stable. And that has to do with funding, because we had so sometimes a more process experiment around it, many moorings, then a little less, and then more again. So let me zero in a bit on that particular challenge here. So what we do here at the 53 North Observatory, we tend to have usually five or six or seven moorings, but sometimes we only really had one, and that's where that green thing came up. And so what we're trying to do is to really understand the transport variability in that part of the overturning circulation regime. And what I'm going to show you is, again, that top record here. Uh, that's uh, the average of all the deep waters, and I'm now going to stratify that with three components. First, I'm showing you the northeastern Atlantic deep water, which is some of the stuff that comes over the Gripps fracture zone. And it does most of the transport variability there. And at the very bottom, you have the Denmark Strait overflow water, the stuff that I showed you before, comes over Detlef Quadfuzzle's uh, record. And also, we see much less variability there. It's much more stable. It does change a little bit. Uh, some correlation with that, but not so great. So you see even these two compartments that make up the lower North Atlantic deep water have some shear to it, some variability, which is not quite the same. We think this is very important to drive the strength of the overturning circulation, but the other ones are exciting as well. So that's the deeper part. But then our array also covers the Labor Sea water proper. So that's the stuff here where the convection that I showed you from the Argo floats goes into. And we've been very, quote, disappointed that the correlation between these temperatures and transport is very minimal. Probably has to do because temperature and salinity work such a way that density differences are not so great. And there's also maybe other things that drive that. But what's very noticeable is that the lower parts have these decadal variability to them, and the Labrador seawater does not. So it's a decoupling between the boundary current layers uh, that we can observe as a record, and a four or five year record wouldn't be so convincing as a 17 year record is. So that's uh, interesting, but as a good scientist, you always say, okay, Martin, I mean, you want to talk about decadal variability with two bumps? It's kind of hard, right? So we these days also try to look into uh, models, and here I'm using uh, some work uh, from a model that Klaus Böning and Arne Biastoch has put together. It's a, it's a Viking model. It's pretty high resolution, the Labrador Sea here. You see a snapshot of the circulation, and they've done some estimates of transport at 53 North. And uh, we had the full observing only in two places. And, and if you look at the model, you say, gee, you know, the most interesting part happened in the 90s where we didn't have the array out. Right? So we're, we're quite excited to look a little bit deeper into that. And Patricia Handmann, who is now at the GST school, I, and I think this week in Cambridge, uh, she's actually trying to compare what we find in the high resolution model with observations. And it's part of her PhD work. She's early in the game, a year into it. But she has two f findings which I found interesting. So here you see in red what the model tells us in transport uh, over uh, these 17 years, more or less, and in gray the observations again. And you see that uh, the model has a bit more vertical correlation than the observations. You are the judge, right? I think they're pretty uncorrelated to some degree. There's some flavors that are similar, but a lot of things that are not. But at least this model has a boundary current, which roughly has the same strengths as observations. Many of the models that we use do not even have that. But the variability seems to be quite different. And we're trying to understand a bit deeper how that works. And uh, it's not so easy. Uh, the models uh, are wind-driven. They are uh, driven with observed winds. So if it was just the wind, they should be 
doing fine, but obviously they're not doing exactly what observations do. So maybe there's something not quite right in the models. Maybe the forcing is wrong. Maybe you didn't understand some of the processes. So it's really exciting questions to keep working on. Now, with my colleague uh, Johannes Kassen from our group, we've taken that same record. I just flipped it upside down here. And we are comparing it to three other records uh, from the region. And these are um, observations on the Oleander section that's cutting across the Gulf Stream here. The Ovid section cuts across the North Atlantic current. And we've also looked at uh, some element of wind driving, Ekman pumping in the support of North Atlantic. And what you see on that nine year decadal variability, so we just did a harmonic here on, for this fit, just a straight harmonic fit with a nine year period. If you do the same for the Ovid section, it's mostly uh, altimeter and Argo based for the upper part with a little bit of hydrography to support it. Same phase, different amplitude. Uh, Oleander, almost the same phase too. So that means something is coherent in that system. We would have not picked it out from this record. It seems noisy, but if you tell it, I, tell me what your nine year period looks like, you see some coherence. Now, maybe it's just because, you know, those nine plus one and a half cycles have been, or almost two cycles, have been fortunate. Maybe there's something systematic. That's what we want to use the models for. So from the observation, there's a tantalizing evidence, and we can actually link it somewhat to a wind-driven forcing. But it's all tantalizing with short records. You know, I wish I had 50 years of observation to show you where we can really ask deeper questions whether such a mode actually exists or whether it's a fluke. But it just gives you a very glimpse picture of what we can do already with observing records, in particular if you stick there for a long time. Uh, but it also tells you that the Sapola North Atlantic is a challenging place. And I'll speak a few, say a few more words about it in a second. So that's the first half of my presentation. Now we can move to a very different zone. Here we're doing some work in Kiel. We're trying to understand these oxygen minimum zones of the world. Oxygen minimum zones uh, are abundant in all subtropical oceans. Uh, they are sort of, if you want to say so, at the end of the ventilation pathway. They are sort of, as age goes, far away from the mixed layers, which supplies oxygen to the ocean. And, and the, the ocean loses oxygen basically by sinking particles, which need oxygen in their combustion or corrosion or renotification process. And what, what's exciting about oxygen is uh, that there are records uh, out there. Uh, and here we've been recovering, Lothar Stammer has done the work, the oxygen, dissolved oxygen in this box, roughly a little bit bigger than that, uh, since 1960. The advantage of oxygen, the technique, how oxygen was observed, hasn't changed much, just titration. We still do it to check our CDDs with titration. So in other biogeochemical methods, we change the methods, and that's not so good for long records. So here we see the evolution of that oxygen minimum zone over time. And in the Atlantic, you see it gets bluer, mean oxygen levels drop. It gets also wider, mean the zone is expanding. And we're interested in the why that is. But it also does have consequences on fisheries. For example, fast hunters like uh, sailfish and tunas, they cannot breathe well in this zone. So they tend to stay where there's more oxygen, and they are now their, the habitat is compressed. They're now living in shallower areas, which makes it easier to fish. But I mean, that's not good for them, right? So we're trying to understand that a bit, the dynamics of this. And our part of the program is really focusing on the processes, how the oxygen gets there. And I'm going to speak to you about that. So a little bit of backup again for the region. So we're looking here in the low oxygen zone. This is a model simulation. Here's an observation from a, from a ship-based hydrographic section, average over many surveys. You see oxygen here going from 14 north to 6 south along this section. And here is the minimum zone. It's the lowest in maybe 450 or 500 meters, somewhere at 13 or so north. And you see much more oxygen in the tropics because that's the equatorial zone. You have mixing, bringing oxygen-rich water. You see more oxygen at depths. That's the North Atlantic deep water bringing oxygenated water to the, to the place. And you see a lot of oxygen at the surface. That's where active mixing and air sea exchange happens. So we're interested in that minimum. We know the ventilation is along isopycnals. It's your ventilated thermocline theory. And oxygen, as you go along the isopycnal, gets depleted. And if you want to understand what the oxygen levels here are and how they operate, you can try to think about, can we close that advection budget? My colleague Peter Brandt has uh, published a paper that tries to close the budget by basically a very simple idea. He basically said, I think 
uh, that uh, budget here, so that, that oxygen is, depends on advection of oxygen-rich water from these subduction zones. And if I had more time, I could explain to you all the details of it. Most of the oxygen we find here at 12, 13 north actually comes from the southern hemisphere. It crosses with the overturning the equator, but it takes a very long uh, pathway to get there. That's why it's so depleted. But advection plays a role. There's probably some eddy mixing horizontally from the side, and the third process could be diapycnal mixing. And I want to focus mostly on the diapycnal mixing, but Peter made an estimate based on but uh, balancing the budget that this is maybe how it should look like. And already in this theoretical or you know, estimate, it came out that maybe 30% of the oxygen supply could be supplied by mixing. That is a lot. When you learn in graduate school about the ventilator thermocline, you learn it's all about advection and isopycnals are almost like, uh, like, uh, like layers which are not penetrable. Now, but now if you're telling you, well, but at the end of this thing, 30% of the oxygen comes across isopycnals, that is a statement, but it's actually a statement of weak circulation rather than that what you're being taught in, in physics class is wrong. So we're trying to understand these regions. They are pretty complex. If you do a full oxygen budget, it's different in different layers. So I don't have the time to explain all of that, but I do want to explain a little bit of how we do that. So here we employed a method uh, together with my chemistry friend, Tosta Tanua, where we're using a tracer release experiment, where we're putting a, a man-made substance into the ocean and trying to understand how that then mixes, because observing mixing is by no means easy. And these uh, purposeful tracer release experiment has the advantage that they average the mixing over many years. You can also measure mixing by looking at, uh, for example, the, the, the turbulence, the turbulent state of the ocean, and I'll show you an example for that. But we think these tracer release experiments are very powerful because they integrate over a long time and in that sense are quite efficient. So we've done two releases in the regions, uh, once here at the gradient between high oxygen and low oxygen, and the other one smack in the middle of the oxygen minimum zones. There are two purposes. This was designed to really look at that cross uh, oxygen flux across the top edge of the oxygen minimum zone, and this was designed to actually also look at some aspects of spreading. Below here, you see a model simulation. I'm going to start it again. Uh, what happens if you put a dye, a tracer, into a circulation model? So we can simulate that, but now what we do is uh, we do and observe that. And this work has been done together with Donato. Your picture is going to show up in a second. She's somewhere over here, and uh, she's been the PhD student who's done all the work. So basically what you do after you put in the dye, you go back, in this case, uh, I think it was six months, uh, 18 months, and 30 months after the release, and you take CDD data, and you'd make a chemical analysis on a gas chromatograph and just look for the stuff that's there. This technique is so powerful because the substance we're putting in SF5 has no, not been applied commercially. It's very hard to get, actually, but it's uh, non-reactive, it's non-toxic, so it stays around and it allows us to uh, observe probably 17 magnitudes of, of dissolution. That means 100 kilograms put in, we are still finding it seven years after the release. And it's because, uh, unlike you, uh, we're in a place where the mean circulation is weak, so we can track it for a long time. And what you basically use, you just look how this thing spreads across isopycnals, and on that spreading rate, you can in uh, infer diapycnal velocity. We've done it in a second experiment, a little deeper down. They sort of look similar. They're not quite the same. So the two heroes of this work is Donata, who I just mentioned, but also Manuela Kerner, another PhD student <coughs> who's looking at the other experiment. So the upshot of both of those experiments uh, was uh, that we can measure the diapycnal uh, mixing rates at the top of the oxocline, which is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 5, and the core, which is 1.06. It's almost the same, very similar. It's the same number that we heard from Leadwell from the Nature experiments first off. But that same small diapycnal mixing of 1 times 10 to the minus 5 is actually capable of supplying 30% of the oxygen into the oxygen minimum zone. That's quite remarkable, actually, from, from a quantitative point of view. Now, we can compare these measurements. These are the two estimates from the trace release experiment with microstructure-based direct measurements. We either do them from ships or from gliders. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just showing you a picture of a ship estimate, and there's the uncertainties of that. The advantage of these techniques is you get more of the water column, but it comes with bigger uncertainties, even if you average over seven or eight uh, cruises that we've done here. So it's pretty exciting work that we can do on the mixing today. We, we can boil down these numbers also with these trace of release experiments. 
But now I want to show you the other aspects uh, that you can do with tracer releases, not only look at the vertical spreading to get the diapictal mixing, but how about the horizontal? So the movie I showed you before here, just three snapshots. So this is what the, what the model tells us where the die should be. And here you sh I'm showing you three surveys from the one release and the other release. For the spreading purpose, they're probably somewhat similar. And you can kind of see that it's very patchy in the beginning, as one would expect, an observation much more patchy than the model. Models are too diffuse. They can't capture all that fine scale. We sort of expect that. But then after uh, 20 months or 30 months, you know, the flavor of what the model did and what we find in observation is kind of similar. So that's in some ways good news. And what Donato did is the second part of a thesis, you can apply the same technique, just looking at Gaussian spreading rates sideways to estimate uh, the, the, uh, the horizontal diffusivity due to eddies, eddy steering. So that's basically what you've done. So you basically take the observations, there's a little, you don't have so many, you try to fit your Gaussians, it's a bit more uncertain, and you can do some other techniques that I refer to Donato's paper, but in essence you get a spreading of the dye in the horizontal. Now, you can see by your eye that it's spreading very fast in that direction and very slow in that direction. So I don't have to be, you don't have to be a deep dynamicist to understand that maybe this could be eddies, but this stuff is probably not eddies because that's jets. This is a, a zonal circulation that you have in the near the tropics a lot. So if you liken this as an eddy flux, well, you can calculate it, but it's probably not really very meaningful. <laughs> so what we've been doing is we're taking this north-south spreading as an estimate of what the eddies do, and my guess is eddies will probably mix things horizontally in both directions similarly. I don't think that they're going to do a lot of a bigger mixing drop in the zonal direction than in Berriviano. So I'm just saying, let's assume that's about 500 meters squared per second what the eddies do. But then you can do something else. So you take, you just understand that there are these jets, we know it also from observation, that they go back and forth. These are part of the equatorial current system. They will also mix things like oxygen back and forth and actually provide some of the oxygen. So here I've done a very simple uh, numerical experiment. You basically do an advection a jet type thing here in the north-south direction. And uh, you take this uh, shear flow, you put some artificial eddy mixing, just like uh, horizontal diffusivity into it. And then basically I have here this blue area, which is my control volume. I throw a lot of uh, molecules of dye in there or just uh, tracer points. And then let them advect and diffuse with that flow field and you see with time they're moving out, right? But actually they're gonna move out much faster east-west than north-south because in the presence of a shear flow, that helps you to do so. You get an undistropic dispersion. And you can calculate um, how many, what the rate of loss of that tracer in this control box is as a function of either being, having more eddy mixing or having a stronger jet field, right? You can imagine that will be different. And here I'm showing you the result of that. Great timing here. So what you see here with time, this over years, these uh, stars and circles are the amount of tracer that was left in that control volume box uh, from our observation. So let's wrap up a bit. So we basically just put a box around here, around this ejection site, and just estimate you know, how rapidly did the tracer leave the box. Right? You can easily estimate that from observations. And because we can find the tracer for so many years, we found it over seven years, actually, the first release. Second one is only in its third year now. We have, we're just doing observations as I speak here. But you can see that the amount of tracer is lower as you go along. It just leaves the box, the control volume. And I'm comparing that with five estimates of my little shear flow simulation. Uh, one which has no, sh no jets, uh, just spreading with uh, 500. Well, that too much uh, uh, tracer stays in the box, so 80s alone won't do it. But then if you increase the jet speeds to one centimeter, two, three, four, you, you're more rapidly losing the dye out of the control volume area. Now, you are the judge, but I would say somewhere between two and three, between the red and the blue curve, that kind of fits the observation the best. So this method allows you to estimate the strength of these shear flows to two centimeters per second. My current meters can't do that. I cannot for sure give you a, a measure an average of two centimeters per second. So I think you can use these tracer dispersions in an intelligent way to also estimate circulation rates. 
in some special regions where that's possible. So I think we're having uh, good fun with that. And again, Manuela will put that in her PhD thesis. So some interesting results that we learned from that regime is the, the, the diapyknol mixing is not uh, very different than we found farther to the north, which is in itself unexpected. Uh, there's theory on diapyknol mixing in the ocean that says if you get closer to the equator, uh, your, uh, your potential from, for wave mixing, the wave energy should be lower. So there was an expectation that the KV should be lower towards the equator. It wasn't. Could have to do with rough bottom topography. It's a whole story in its own right. I can't get into it, but it's actually the canonical value. That is responsible for 30% of the oxygen. That's amazing. Um, and uh, the other 30% is by eddies and the last 30% by mean flows. Uh, we were able to estimate the efficiency of eddies at 450. Also amazing, in our model that we used from Klaus Burning, same number came out, right? So it seems like the, the model captured the eddy field fairly well. Uh, but we were also able to actually estimate the strength of these jets, uh, which we're also trying to do with moorings and so on. But I think that's a more powerful technique because it integrates about the whole flow field. So this uh, loss was uh, quite exciting. So you heard me speak about these two tales, about overturning circulation and tropical oxygen minimum zones but you'd expect certainly more from me. And so the question now is from this little background, taking a bit more of a uh, bird's eye perspective on it. So uh, where are the opportunities for the future? I think being a marine scientist these days is really exciting. Certainly we've never had so many observations of the ocean before. Uh, with robotic platforms like Argo coming online, you have so much more ability to look at aspects of the ocean circulation with robotic platforms like gliders being available to us, we can expand our footprint from research vessels to do process experiments. I showed you some of the exciting things you can do with tracer releases. You can do also uh, look at tracer spreading. So that's really exciting. But I would say the difficult part is to keep that excitement and that dedication to ocean observing alive over your career. Most of us are in the business of writing proposals uh, few of them have, have are longer than three years, some of them are five years, but very rarely do you get a writer proposal that has seven years of funding, let alone a decade. But if you want to piece together uh, an, an observational record of 30 years, you know, and you want to study decadal climate variability, people look at you, oh, come on, 30 years, that's three cycles. I mean, any good physicist would say, give me 10 cycles and you're my friend, right? So if you want to get to those 10 cycles, that's a, that's, that's a century. That takes three dedicated careers of people. And, and, and how do we do that? How can we sustain ocean observing over a long time? That is by no means easy. Uh, you know, the continuous plankton recorder folks have done a great job at this. Some heroes are around. But I do wonder, talking to the next generation, how dedicated are you to marine science to actually devote your career to sustain ocean observing? And would it be crazy? <laughs> because maybe the funders say, whoa, <laughs> you're really look, looking at me to fund you for 30 years to do the same thing? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we get so many exciting proposals about some new stuff, right? So I think this is hard. Uh, I know some of you are trying very hard, and I really applaud. Uh, uh, so let me start with the, with the continuation of my northern end here. So we've been manning for 17 years this 53 North Array. It's now being part of an international program called OSNAP where I know the UK is heavily invested in, so is the United States, and we do our bit. So nations coming together to try to cover all of that. And I think it's a very exciting regime of looking at the various boundary flows, deep flows, inflows, just across a section of the whole subpolar North Atlantic. It's an exciting operation. We've never done this before. There's wonderful processes that we can understand. There's certainly an appetite for long-term records there as well. But I think it's a great project, and, and I hope we'll manage to sustain that. You have uh, Rapid, a little bit farther to the, nows, to the south, not for 17 years quite yet, Mike, but I think you, you, you're, you're more than a decade long. And usually, uh, Jürgen Fischer taught me that, Harry. Jürgen always said, well, you know, in time series science and oceanography and anywhere else, you can write the next paper when the time series doubles. What does that mean? You have one year of data, you put a paper out, say, oh, look at this great stuff. You have two years of data, say, hey, this year looks different than the last. 
you know, three years is kind of like you say, okay, the third year is yet different than the first two, it doesn't get you anywhere. Five years means, wow, now I have five years. See, I see a trend maybe. I'll show you that, right? <laughs> and, then, and then after 10 years, say, hey, trend is not there. Huh? So, uh, <laughs> but, but now, between five and 10 years, you are past the PhD lifetime, right? <laughs> so, and, and, and then if you have 10 years, the next exciting point probably shows up at 30. That's a career, right? No paper in a career, that's kind of tough to sell. Ed, are, are you funding that, you know, 20 years of? <laughs> so, so that is hard. It is really hard, and, but we as a community, we need to grapple with this, right? Because at the end, if you run an ocean model, you know, those who have 20 year time series, these are your heroes. That's the kind of stuff you want. You don't want to pay them to do it, but you want the answer, right? So, so that's, that's a good challenge. So, and I think one way out of that is to ask the question, so then why do we do ocean observing in these long time series? I have two more minutes. And I think we do it for a number of different reasons, not just discovery, what most of you do here, but quite often they're helpful to understand and advise society on is uh, climate changing, yes or no, in the ocean. It can be about life in the ocean, food security, fisheries, things like that. Marine services can be also supported by things that add up to be a long time series. And I'm quite interested in sustainable development. So I think there's a number of different reasons why we do these observations, not just for climate science. And this is what led us to develop this so-called framework for ocean observing, which really takes these various uses at the top and tries to make the case for sustained and long-term observing, not just for science, but for science plus. And, and there's, a, there's a great uh, work around that. I can't get into all the details. But for the Atlantic, uh, I'm part of an EU project called Atlantos, where we're really trying to sort of take this idea forward and ask the question, observing in the Atlantic, why are we doing it? Do we have what we need? I mean, do the observation that we have, process long term, uh, cover all our aspirations, all our scientific needs, but also our service needs, our assessment needs? And, and, and are they integrated? Are the physical oceanographers, which I showed you here, I mean, how many biology chemistry records do I have on my moorings? One or two. How much ecology? Zero. That's bad. Right? We put a lot of funding into to get there, to put the stuff out. Why don't we do some ecology on the way? So integrating our work can give us more efficiency, which makes your funder more happy, but also gives you more reason to do what you do. I think so these are the kinds of things we're trying to work on to answer that question. What is the motivation and can we sustain observing for a long run? And our result will hopefully be a blueprint for Atlantic observing, that is, where we will make the case for things like OSNAP, for RAPID, Argo, BioArgo, continuous plankton recorder, uh, sampling for genomes, and many other things. Thank you for listening. It's great to be here. <laughs>